ancient biblical prophets wrote about the future. Today, theologians are poring over those scriptures with a firm belief that their prophecies are coming to pass. Journey now into the world of eschatology on Prophecy in the News with author and lecturer J.R. Church. On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to take a look at John chapter 12 and the wonderful, triumphal entry of our Savior. Now, there's a lot of prophetic significances to this particular chapter. Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me the triumphal entry. Thanks, J.R. And you know, John is a wonderful book of the Bible. It's exciting. Every chapter is exciting, J.R., but I think chapter 12 may be a, a pinnacle moment. It's the moment for which the people of Israel had longed for centuries. They had longed for their Messiah to come in. And John chapter 12 uh, speaks of his entry into Jerusalem. And it begins, then uh, Jesus, six days uh, before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, uh, which uh, was, which had been dead, <clears throat> whom he raised from the dead. Now, J.R., that sets the scene for an amazing event. Yes. Spring was in the air. Pilgrims were preparing to go to Jerusalem from all over the uh, country. And an ex a certain excitement was there. Jesus and his disciples had been spending the last six months on the other side of the Jordan River in another country, just east of Jordan. Uh, somewhere, you know, around the foot of Mount Nebo. And uh, Jesus had been to Jerusalem twice in the last six months, once for the dedication, uh, the Feast of Dedication in December, and then he came back in uh, February or early March and raised Lazarus from the dead. Now he was coming back for the Feast of Passover. And the disciples were, grew more and more fearful as the days approached. For they felt a, a, a heaviness, an ominous uh, foreboding, knowing that Jesus and the disciples had been east of the Jordan to uh, keep from being arrested. They were out of the country, out of the jurisdiction of the temple authorities, knowing that when they did get to Jerusalem, uh, it, it, that it was entirely possible that they would all be arrested for sedition. And so as they got ready to go on this journey, Jesus took them aside and he said, look, I want to tell you what's going to happen. And, um, you know, all of the Gospels mention this. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. When Jesus takes them aside, let me read uh, just a little portion from Matthew's Gospel. It says that Jesus uh, said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests, unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. And he shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and mock, and scourge, and crucify him. And on the third day he shall rise again. Fascinating here that they should that Jesus should tell them what's going to happen, and yet, went right over their heads. They were out one ear and out the other, you know, they didn't understand a thing. And by the way, this happens repeatedly in the New Testament, and John chapter 12 explains why it happens and how it happens. This principle of, uh, of blinding uh, a people partially so that they do not immediately understand what's going on. You know, J.R., he's the king of the universe. He controls all the events of time and space, all the, the events of, of redemption, uh, think of the juxtaposition of his having gone to Bethany, raised Lazarus from the dead, and then uh, going the rest of the way into the city, mm -hmm. setting up all these events in order yes. so that the people would follow him and so that the Pharisees would be absolutely confused about what was going on and very angry, by the way. Yeah, fascinating. Well, he comes to Bethany. Now, as they left, uh, crossed the, the Jordan River, went through Jericho, they uh, had uh, a meal with Zacchaeus, then he healed blind Bartimaeus and his friend, and then on to Jerusalem. He may have spent the night there in Jericho. Early the next morning, they started in toward uh, Jerusalem and Bethany area, and um, probably got there early afternoon. There was a lot of excitement flurry around because they knew Jesus was coming. They had prepared uh, the food. They were getting ready for a supper that night. Martha served the supper, but it was in the home of Simon the leper, uh, another of Jesus' friends. I suppose a rather prominent man in the area whom Jesus had healed of leprosy. And uh, so they sat down at the meal. It was probably rather lighthearted. Uh, they were having a wonderful time 
when suddenly Mary came in. Now, this probably, Gary, was a meal for men. There mm -hmm. probably were no women there. Martha served. Mary probably broke up the meeting a little bit when she came in. She had this, this vial of ointment, mm -hmm. of spikenard. <clears throat> Yes. Worth 300 pence or 300 denarii. Now, it, in those days, a denarii was a one day's wages for the average household. So, uh, this was nearly a year's uh, salary for the average family. She brought in this very expensive ointment, poured it on his head, poured it mm -hmm. on his feet, wiped her feet with her, uh, his feet with her hair. And the disciples, according to the other Gospels, were all upset about it. Not just <clears throat> Judas Iscariot, but all of them were wondering, what is this? And uh, of course, Jesus uh, came to her defense, especially here. John tells us that, um, uh, that Judas Iscariot in particular was angry. And John later reflecting upon that tells us why. He was greedy, he had the bag, mm -hmm. uh, he was the treasure of the group, and over the past three years he had become very fond of the funds. <laughs> and he just decided, you know, that he'd rather have the money. And so uh, he complained, and Jesus said, Let her alone against the day of my burying hath she kept this, the poor you have always with you, but me you have not always. Now, Gary, in another one of the Gospels, Jesus said what she has done, she's done what she could, what she has done is going to be spoken of as a memorial for her. Mm -hmm. Always. Always. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. And, and J.R., I have uh, some oil of spikenard, and I sometimes demonstrate it to people when I come to this part of the Bible. <clears throat> Take a couple of drops of it, put it on blotting paper, and it fills the just two drops absolutely fill a large room with the most amazingly wonderful aroma. It's like, it reminds me of a, of a high-quality aftershave lotion. Very masculine, crisp, brisk aroma, but to, to put a whole box of ointment of spikenard on him, I mean the whole city must have spelled, smelled like spikenard. <laughs> this was a memorial to talk about. Yes. It's an amazing thing. And Judas said, we should have uh, sold this and given the money to the poor. He wanted to set up a charitable organization. And by the way, I'm <laughs> sure his motivation would be to be the head of the charity and to skim off some yes. of the profits. That's the kind of guy he was. And it also sort of reminds me of... Uh now, I don't mean to be unkind, but a lot of liberal theologians don't have any conservative views, but they do have a social gospel. Yes. And it's, it's, uh, uh, it is a gospel to help the poor, and that's good. I'm not saying that it's not. I'm just saying that that takes precedence over or replaces the gospel of eternal life. I couldn't agree more. And by the way, a lot of the uh, purveyors of the social gospel <coughs> are very wealthy men. Enough said about that. Uh, they are helping themselves to <laughs> many of the funds that are supposed to go to the poor. And I think that's a lesson that's implied here <coughs> in this particular event. Uh, so Jesus is memorialized at JR. Uh, this sets the scene. He's set up a series of events now raised Lazarus from the dead. He's come into Bethany, just outside Jerusalem. He has set the scene. Yes. And then in John 12, 12 says, on the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees. Yes. Now, according to history, in, in the temple during Passover in Bible days, up to a quarter of a million lambs were slain. And a lamb would feed up to ten people. So there could have been a million people, pilgrims there from all over the area. And hearing about Jesus, especially Lazarus being raised from the dead, they just spontaneously got those palm branches, went out into the Kedron Valley, lined up along the road to watch this great man who had raised the dead come into Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. It was something that could not have been organized. It had to be spontaneous. And uh, so Jesus sends the disciples up to Bethphage, which is at the top of the hill. Bethany is on the east slopes of, of uh, the Mount of Olives. Bethphage is at the top, and then to the west lies Jerusalem. At the top, there is this road that goes from Bethany, east and west, from Bethany over to Jerusalem. But there's also a road that goes north and south along the crest of the ridge uh, line of the, uh, of the hills and the mountains, Mount Scopus, Mount of Olives. 
And so Bethphage is right there where the two ways met. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, go get me a donkey. And this was to fulfill the prophecy. Zechariah in particular said, your king comes to you riding upon a donkey. And so they come, they bring the donkey and the, uh, the little donkey, the foal. And Jesus then gets on the donkey and they ride over to Jerusalem. It's a fascinating, absolutely incredible uh, uh, story here. I want to just mention to you that in Bible days, a donkey was not a beast of ill repute. It was a, a, um, a well-regarded beast that kings would ride when they were coming in peace into a city. And that was the occasion here. We have more. We'll be back in just a moment. This triumphal entry of our Lord was foretold in the scriptures. Uh, for example, in Ezekiel, um, we're, we're told that Ezekiel asked the Lord at his second coming, what are we going to do with this closed gate? And the Lord said that he had entered in by it, therefore it shall be shut. Uh, so it is, it is my thinking that the triumphal entry was into the eastern gate. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, on the next day when Jesus came in, he, he came over to the top of the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem. Um, as he started his descent, the valley was filled with people. There could have been a million people there, just spontaneously. I imagine his disciples were giddy that day with joy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, why, why, did, why did we need to fear when we left uh, Jericho and the Jordan area? Why, this is wonderful. The people are going to accept him. And they probably looked at Jesus and tears were running down his cheeks. Mm. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He wept over the city, and he said, If thou hadst known in this thy day, but he said, Now it's hidden from your eyes. They're going to lay you even with the ground. Mm -hmm. He prophesied right there. So Jesus knew what was coming. He knew what the end of the week would be. He knew that those people down there that were shouting and, and waving the palm branches, that they really weren't his disciples. They really didn't understand who he was. They did not recognize him. And uh, uh, so he knew what lay ahead. He could hear the crucify him, crucify him. <laughs> we'll not have this man reign over us. Yeah. And you know, Gary, another thing. Um, Jesus looked at those, let's say, million people. We don't know if there were that many, but there could have been 100,000, 500,000, maybe a million. He looked out there at that vast throng of people in that valley below. And he remembered that in just a few days, there were going to be millions upon millions of people in paradise who would be welcoming him mm. there. Wow. And I imagine he also remembered, uh, remembered into the far future for two millennia, all of the millions upon hundreds of millions or billions of people who would believe in him over the next 2,000 years and they would be there to welcome him someday in the future. So this particular triumphal entry uh, was clouded with the, with the fact that Jesus knew what was coming. And by the way, he was there to die, not to reign. Mm. But he came as the king of glory. And by the way, uh, there are some interesting Bible quotes uh, from the Old Testament. Uh, um, verse 13 says, The crowd with the palm branches said, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Will you turn back to Psalm 118, J.R., which, by the way, is a very crucial, critical, prophetic psalm uh, by its placement. And you read in verses 25 and 26, Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. Well, save now is the English translation of Yashana or Hosanna. As we, it's yes. a declarative. Save us now. We, we just, we, we declare that we want this to happen. I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Which is the messianic greeting. In other words, that is the cry of the people to their Messiah. They knew who they were talking to. Mm -hmm. Also, in Psalm 24, we have the third of the shepherd psalms, and uh, they ask the, uh, the David asked the question, Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. 
Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. So this, I think, is a preview of the triumphal entry that day when Jesus uh, rode the donkey into Jerusalem. But J.R., somebody else was watching too. The Pharisees were watching. Verse 19, they said among themselves, Perceive ye how long ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. Yeah. Uh, they're saying everybody is following him. They are in a state of absolute despair. That means they looked out and saw a sea of humanity in that valley below. There were no thousand people there or ten thousand people there. They had to be a half a million or, or more. You yes, know? yes. It was so full that these, and by the way, when they said, save us now, can you hear those Pharisees? Oh, just cringing absolutely. because they knew they were going to be in trouble with the Romans. The Romans, you know, iron rule. And uh, they could have taken all those Pharisees and put them in prison and replaced them with other politicians. Indeed. To, you know, if they couldn't keep the people um, controlled. And so they sent someone out to Jesus and uh, they said, uh, say, uh, could, could you ask these people to please quieten it down, be a little more dignified, please? Mm. And Jesus said, if I told them to be quiet, the stones would cry out. Wow. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. Well, we have set the scene. And now Jesus teaches. <clears throat> the 23rd verse of John chapter 12 uh, it begins this way with Jesus' proclamation, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. J.R., he begins a teaching here. Yes. And the Greeks had come in the previous verses wanting to see him. This, of course, added to this idea that the whole world has gone after him. Mm -hmm. And as he begins to teach, he says, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So, actually, he is saying here, uh, the whole world has come after, come after me. These, uh, these million people or half million people that are in the valley and the Greeks here uh, from uh, the far-flung countries of Greece. Mm -hmm. Maybe other people from around the world were there. Jesus said, listen, you haven't seen anything yet. Uh, the whole world is going to be evangelized and have the opportunity to receive Christ and have eternal life. But he said, in order to do that, the grain must fall into the ground and die. Mm -hmm. That's Absolutely. the only way uh, we can really multiply the gospel message and get the, get the word out for people to be saved. This fundamental teaching was later picked up, uh, particularly by the Apostle Paul. And, uh, but Peter and Paul and the rest uh, learned <clears throat> what later, what they did not now know, that the plan of Jesus was to create a pattern of resurrection for a, a great body of believers that they hadn't even thought about. Uh, Jesus called them other sheep. That's us, folks. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I think he was in the temple compound at this time when he was yeah. teaching. Mm -hmm. I think he might have been in the uh, court of the Gentiles by the time, because the Greeks came wanting to see him. Uh, maybe they were Hellenized Jews, but the Bible does say Greeks. So somewhere on the Temple Mount, maybe over on the south side, Jesus was there. And uh, then he says, um, my so soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? Oh, oh, he said, this is the reason I came to this hour. And then he turned his eyes upward and said, Father, glorify thy name. And then suddenly a clap of thunder raced across the cloudless sky, and the disciples heard God speak. Some of the others there said it sounded like thunder. Some said maybe an angel. But God said, uh, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And this Jesus said to them, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. What a spooky time that must have been. Jesus oh. is talking, and God speaks. And even from, the, uh, from another dimension, uh, the reverberations just spread throughout the sky. The voice of God like thunder. Yeah. That's awe-inspiring. It, it, it sends a chill through me when I stop and think about it. And Jesus says something chilling. As a response to that, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes, he says. Verse 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Oh, yes. that's, that's a key time. 
And you know, this is a good time for us to compare John chapter 12 with Revelation chapter 12 because here Jesus says the prince of this world is going to be cast out and in Revelation 12 we see the old dragon cast out of heaven to the earth. Absolutely. Also, this being the 12th chapter is the Lamed chapter. That is the 12th uh, letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And uh, my, uh, Rabbi Michael Monk wrote this about the Lamed. He said, and he's a rabbi now, not a Christian, and in his book called uh, The uh, Wisdom in the Hebrew Alphabet, he said that it, Lamed is a majestic letter towering above the other letters from its position in the center of the alphabet, thus it symbolizes the King of Kings. Wow. <laughs> and here we have the triumphal entry. <laughs> what a fantastic way to put it. Yes, sir. So is. John is very alphabetic. He is a mystic, he's a Jew, and he's giving us things that you don't hear in other Christian commentaries. We'll be back in just a moment.